Hello, welcome to The Big Picture. My name is Kevin Vent, and I am the host of The Big Picture. And I'm here today with my guest, Ryan Panette. Happy to be here, Kevin. Thanks it's for having me on. Great to have you here, Ryan. And though, Ryan, this is your first time on The Big Picture, Correct. it is not the first time that we've done sports talk. Today. No, we have, uh, for a couple of years, have done sports talk and That's go right. a, little, a little ways back we go, on that. We go a little so. ways back on that, but this is the first time together in quite a while on The Big Picture. Yeah, so. well, I'm happy, happy to be here on The Big Picture. And it's great to have you. In The Big Picture, we talk about sports. And we don't talk about the typical day-to-day -day sports things that are going on this game or that game. We tend to focus on slightly big picture issues in sports. And we have a couple of great topics for you today. As we've taped the big picture tonight, the Patriots are currently 9-0. and So I guess I want to start off talking about the Patriots season thus far, kind of taking apart each section of the Patriots. So to start off, I want to talk about the Patriots offense, then we'll talk about the defense, and then we'll talk about special teams. So Ryan, let's start off with offense. What are some of the good things you've seen out of the offense this year? I mean, I think one of the good things that we've seen since 2001 and 2000 is Tom Brady. I mean, right, you obviously. Look at, you look at Tom Brady, uh, just happens having an absolute stellar year. He's completing 67.8% mm -hmm. of his passes, has 24 touchdowns thus far, three interceptions. He looks like he's playing better than ever. He does. He, 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 does. he gets better with age. He's like a yeah. fine wine. It's, un <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, the kind of numbers that he's putting up, there's, you know, Tom is making things happen. Mm -hmm. And if, if it was, you know, if it was Jimmy, love right. Jimmy, but I don't know <laughs> if it would be the same thing. But, but Tom, you know, he already has over 3,000 yards yep. in the season. He's averaging 338.1 yards a game. Mm -hmm. That's stellar. That, it, it you is, can't ask much for much more than your quarterback. absolutely stellar. And I really think the place where Tom has improved this year over other years is his movement, both in the pocket. He's always moved well in the pocket, but his movement outside of the pocket. It's rare for us to see Brady take three or four or five steps to the right and throw the ball. Well, he's it totally throws off year. the defense because they yep. expect him to stay in one spot. But what he's doing is he's moving and getting, getting out of the pocket and forcing them to either... I love that they, they got, he keeps them honest because yep. they always come up thinking Brady's going to run. Right. Everyone in the world knows Brady's not going to run, <laughs> but just when you think he's not going to run, he does. he's going to run on you. Yeah, and you know the, the, the knock on Brady through all the years, and it's been a legitimate one, is that if you pressure him up the middle, he gets flustered, not flustered, but he, he, ha he feels the need to get rid of the ball more quickly. This year he seems to be moving out of the pocket just a little bit so that that rush up the middle doesn't seem to bother him all that much. Yeah, and, you know, and he's been doing a really good job of keeping his eyes downfield, as always, but really spreading the ball around, too. Yeah. When you look at people who have been targeted by him, it's yes, Gronk's going to have his, his receptions. Yes, Julian Edelman's going to have his receptions. But really, there's been a lot of people who Absolutely. have been targeted, which for a defense is, is maddening to try right, to figure right. out where I mean, he's going to go with Really, the ball. for a defense, you ha every, every guy who goes out into, into, you know, you have to cover him. You have to cover every single guy who goes up because every single one of them is a potential target for Brady. I think one of his best targets, uh, mm -hmm. Julian Edelman, yep. has really, I think, this year kind of put himself out there as one of the elite receivers in the NFL. Yeah, he has. Unfortunately, Unfortunately. <laughs> um, we're not going to see him uh, probably until the playoffs right. uh, to be able to come back from the broken foot, which right. really is, is an enormous loss. When you look at him, he's, he's had 61 receptions so far on mm -hmm. 88 targets, so clearly right. one, of Tom's, one of Tom's favorite targets. Almost 700 uh, receiving yards, seven touchdowns. Um, but the biggest stat that I have from Julian Edelman he has been uh, he has been responsible in the target of 37 third down conversions wow. Wow. this year, and that's um, huge. That's absolutely huge. When it comes down, down to it, when you make a playoff push, that's your biggest thing. You need to convert on third yep. down, and Julian has been able to make it happen through these. First and the Patriots games. are number one in the league on third down conversion percentage, and, and Julian Edelman is a big piece of that. The uh, broken foot that Edelman has is likely to keep him out six to eight weeks. There's seven weeks left in the regular season. Theoretically, we could see him back for the final game of the regular season, but I, I'm really hoping at least we'll have him for the playoffs. I think if you hold him out, if the Patriots can continue to play well, get a first round bye, yeah. you have him back, give that yeah. extra week to get I him agree. back and ready. Uh, I agree. And then see how it rolls in yeah, the Yeah, I agree. The I, think, I think if they have the first round bye secure, he's not going to play in that final game of the season, regardless of what goes on. Sure. So we've talked, the po biggest positive this year, Tom Brady, and I totally agree with that. The biggest difference in the offense this year is Tom Brady and the way he's played. Um, even though it's an offense that is on pace to break the NFL single season scoring record, um, any cons that you see, any negatives you see in the offense, you know, or, there are areas that might need to be tweaked. There are a few things. Um, you know, obviously, you can't do anything about the injuries, right. but the injuries are, are hurting. Yeah, um, Deion Lewis is another. Deion one Lewis there. is another one. You know, a guy who showed a lot of promise. You kind of had the, the, you know, the, the flash and bang with right. Legarrette Blunt and Deion Lewis. Um, but I think one of the biggest things is Brady is putting the ball on target more often than not. Mm -hmm. People are not catching it all that often <laughs> for Tom. Uh, well, you had you LaFell at, with the one game with six points. Right, six, I mean, six, and six granted, he, you know, that's coming off of him on injury reserve right. and whatnot, 
but you need to, you're a professional football player. You need to be right. able to catch the ball. Right. Um, you know, look at last week. Scott Chandler was was ta right. targeted against the Giants a bunch of different times and yeah. dropped the ball. There was the one play where, where Scott Chandler... Right on his hands. Perfect pass on the hands. Yeah. The very next play, Gronk caught it on his shoestrings right. and then, <laughs> and, you know, was able to turn up field. So right. there's not a lot of cons because we're yeah. putting up... The Patriots are putting up a whole bunch of points. Yeah, I think um, the offensive line has performed well despite all the difficulties it has. But you got to think as it gets closer to the playoffs with more difficult teams that the offensive line could also be a problem. Absolutely. And I think there's been some injuries. And there's been a lot of rotation. You've mm -hmm. had Stork who's been in and out and right. Solar with the injury. Um, that's going to be a big sticking point for the, for the yeah. Patriots. And again, when Tom has time, when you can get Tom Brady to stand flat-footed in the pocket and he can see out the field, right. He's, he's better. He's better than anyone right. that has ever been. Right. But once there's the pressure, it's, it adds another element. So that, the offensive line needs to. Yeah. They're doing good enough. Right. To be able to get them. They are doing as you make I a agree. playoff push. And, and one thing that uh, one small concern I have also, which is related to the offensive line, and that is um, the run game also. Okay. And with the loss of Deion Lewis, you're primarily counting on Legarrette Blunt, and I love Legarrette Blunt, but. Uh, the offensive line has the tendency against good run defensive teams that they have virtually no running game whatsoever. Right. Um, against a poor uh, running game, running defense, you know they do fine. And Blunt is able to pull off some of those six, seven, eight yard runs up the middle and all that kind of thing. Blunt is not an outside runner though. He no. will not go to the outside, and he shouldn't. Which means that the run defense can focus on packing the middle on obvious running downs and that kind of thing. And you see that in goal line stuff. So just being creative with that and right. figuring that out, I think, will be important. And you know what? We've got the best best coach in the National Football League best to be coach able to. In the game. National Football League, next best offensive coordinator in the National Football League, in yep. my opinion, and Josh McDaniel. And so there's the next man up, and it'll be interesting. You know, maybe there, maybe James White will step forward and be that guy that Deion Lewis was this year. Who knows? We'll see. Um, but uh, it is a little concerning on that area. But sure. as I said, it's hard to to uh, to criticize the highest scoring offense in the NFL. <laughs> but, but you got to look for something. Right, you got to assign something. So we want to move on from the offense and take a look at the defense. Uh, the defense this year going into this season was something that I was really, really worried about sure. uh, because of the loss of Revis and the loss of Browner and that kind of thing. What's your take on, say, the, the defensive backfield this year thus far? I think the defensive backfield has been doing what they need to do. I think you look at Malcolm Butler coming off of the, you know, the miracle play in the right. Super Bowl last year. I think he's really proven himself as a solid mm -hmm. uh, defensive back. You look at the games that he's, he's been the guy who's been on the number one right. receivers. This past week against Odell Beckham Jr., there was the one play where Odell Beckham took it for the right. but not really. Not really, I mean, not really his Malcolm fault. got beat, right. but he should have had the help on that as well. Yeah, but you look at the rest. That should have been a, a 15 or 20 Look at the fourth quarter most. performance against. Unbelievable. He was fantastic. So, Unbelievable. Um, where you lose Browner from last year and you lose Revis, that was a, a, a sticking point there. Right. Was, I don't know what's going to happen. One thing I like they've... about the defensive backfield is the safeties. McCourty, Chung, I think. The, one of the best safety combinations in the NFL. Uh, McCourty, a former you know, a corner who has moved to safety, and Chung, who has kind of had a resurgence coming back to the Patriots from Philadelphia. And I've been very pleased with their play. And, and same thing with Malcolm Butler. One of the things that the uh, Belichick uh, defense really requires is that shutdown corner. The whole thing starts with that shutdown yep. corner. And you saw it with Ty Law, you saw it with Dar Darrell Rivas. You know, when he has that guy, you saw it with Asante Samuel. When he has that guy, the rest of the defense kind of works. Right. Uh, when you doesn't have that guy, the defense struggles. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it doesn't do it doesn't do as well there. Right. But I think what they, what they have are the four guys that are playing back there is a pretty good core. And I think sure. and a, a bunch of the guys who have subbed in and out too have been yep. able to fill the role. Yep. I mean, it, it you de it's definitely not Darrell right. Revis and Brendan Browner, but yeah. these guys are, are showing up and playing. If I had to pick another positive, it's the linebacking core. I never would have imagined we would have got to this point of the year and you never hear Gerard Mayo's name. You never hear. It's like I, the guy disappeared. I'm in a fantasy league where we pick individual <laughs> oh, defensive okay. players, and Gerard Mayo has done nothing done for absolutely me nothing. You know, but uh, Dante Hightower has picked it up. Fantastic. And, and uh, you know, the linebacking core has been very, very good. Yeah, and you know, I think Rob Ninkovich has done a great job. Yeah, just is, leadership, just yep. in the leadership of that linebacking core yep. and the defense as a whole. You know, when he's on the field and he's barking out signals to people. He's got yep. everything in control. He's yep. got the beard like Matt Patricia. It's, it's an extension of Patricia out there on the yep. out on the field. But Ninkovich really reminds me a little bit of Bruski. Yeah. Who didn't have the physical skills coming in, but has shown himself to be a leader and just always seems to be there when when something's going on. You Absolutely. know, and, and he's the guy who's tipping the passes, and he's the guy who's putting a little pressure on the quarterback from that outside. And Ninkovich has been spectacular. If I had to pick one con in the defense, and I think the defense has played very, very well, I think it's they're the fifth or sixth best scoring defense in the league uh, this year. So it's hard to complain about that. Uh, but I look at the pass rush. 
Now, they, the, you know, Chandler Jones is leading the league in sacks, so everyone goes, oh, well, they have a great pass uh, rush defense. The issue that I have is it doesn't seem as though that the pass rush really hurries the quarterback a lot when they're not blitzing. Right. I don't know if you've noticed that. Yeah, and I, I think what it is is, is they're, when there's a blitz and when, there's, when they're stunting up front, that's when you're getting the guys in there. That's when yeah. Jamie Collins is able right. to get in and there. Right, and we didn't even mention Jamie you know, Collins. And that's, and that's where Chandler Jones is able to get in. Yeah. Um, but when you get to a point where uh, the quarterback can go and see the field and really have a good vision of it mm -hmm. and doesn't feel pressured, that's where it's going to put the pressure on Malcolm sure. Butler. It's going to put the pressure on Patrick Chung and the rest of the guys in the right. defensive backfield because they have to hold on to their guys that much quicker. If right. you're going to force right. the quarterback to have a quick release, it makes it easier on the rest of the sure. field. But we're not doing that all that much. One thing I would say the defensive line has been very good at this year, however, is the run game, stopping the run game. I expected when Vince Wilfork left that there was going to be a little drop off there. But, you know, once again, uh, Vince Wilfork is not having a great season in, in, in Houston. Once again, the Patriots know when to let a guy go. Right. And, and you know, they, they've, you've seen it time and time again, especially with defensive players, Willie McGinnis and Richard Seymour and, and, and uh, um, uh, Lawyer Malloy and what have you. You know, they know when it's time to let the guy go. Bill just knows. That's why he just in knows. Bill we trust. You and know, Bill it's we sad trust. to see a guy like Vince Wilfork Vince go because he's a great player. character guy. Yeah. Vince is my favorite player in the Patriots, or was my favorite player in the Patriots, uh, and I was really sad to see him go, but you watch him. I watched the Texans game this past Sunday night. He was a non-factor, an yeah. absolute non-factor. They have a good running game at, right. for the Bengals, uh, you know, and, and the Texans defense was very good um, on uh, Sunday night, but Will Fork was barely a part of that, and so I was really concerned about that, but I say that the, tech, the uh, Patriots' run defense has been better than we expect. I know we're getting short on time in this half. Uh, we want to talk about special teams. Pros for the special teams. Steven Guskowski, best kicker in the league. <laughs> best kicker it in was the league. The, Bar sealed, none. Sealed up the game for us against uh, yep. the, the New York uh, Giants. You know, I think they've done a good job on special teams. You know, you're not going to get much from a return game in the NFL right. these days. Right. Especially could, kick returns. We could do better on a punt return kind of basis. Sure. Matthew Slater is... I think he's the best special teams player in NFL. I think I really so. And, and, and he's gotten on the Pro Bowl and he's gotten yep. that, get, gotten that he's honor. He's gotten that recognition. Um, yeah. So I think in that phase of the game, I'm never really concerned about the Patriots. Although... Against the against the Washington Redskins, the surprise onside kick, like yeah, you know they're they're <laughs> executing well and can do their part That's with it. That's absolutely right. You know, it was, it was uh, concerning way back when when Vinatieri left, and only the Patriots would be able to replace. Uh, potential Hall of Fame kicker like Vinatieri with a potential Hall of Fame kicker in Gustowski. He's consistently the best scorer in the league, and uh, he's had the, the, the X number of in a row and all that kind of stuff. So uh, he's really done fantastic. And special teams is not a place uh, to, that we have to bother to, 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 to When Gustowski walks out on the field, I'm pretty confident that he's going to nail it. So yeah, yeah, there you it's go. a good feeling to have. All right, well, that does it for the first half here in the, in the big picture. And uh, we've talked about the Patriots, and hopefully you have uh, can Talk with your friends about some of your pros and your cons of the Patriots season thus far. We will be back in just one moment. My name is Kevin Vent. We'll be back on uh, just one second here on The Big Picture on RCTV. Abundant Life Christian School is a school committed to the nurture of the whole child. Academically, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Our staff have been called by God to enter the teaching profession. As evidence of God's call, they are dedicated to and gifted in the task of helping parents grow kids God's way. Academically, students are engaged in the combination of the best of both worlds, tradition and innovation. Character values are emphasized throughout days that focus on a broad educational experience and a strong academic foundation. To learn more about Abundant Life Christian School, please go to our website at www.ablifeschool.org. Well, welcome back to the big picture here on RCTV. I continue to be Kevin Vent, your host. This continues to be Ryan Panette, my guest. Hopefully you enjoyed those uh, few messages from our friends. We want to start the second half of the big picture by talking about kind of a different topic. As I, I honestly have never heard this topic talked about in sports talk anywhere. No. Uh, so not that it hasn't, hasn't ever been done, but but I feel as though this is kind of original to me a little bit. Uh, so I, I know we've, we've danced around this issue for a number of years and trying around, to talk yeah, about yeah, what We have teams. danced around it, but, but here we go. So uh, what we're talking about in the second half here is the best team of each of the four sports in Boston that did not win a championship. 
Okay, championship teams are always great. And actually, to be honest with you, some of these teams are probably better than some of the championship teams. But these are the best teams, in our opinion, in each by the Patriots, Red Sox, Celtics, and Bruins who did not win a world championship. And we're going to start off with the New England Patriots. So, Ryan, I think this one's pretty straightforward <laughs> for the most part. But what is what do you think was the best Patriots team that did not win a championship? I know all the Steve Grogan guys and, and <laughs> Steve right. Grogan lovers are going to say 86, but you can't... 2007, you know, the team that... The team that almost, the um, almost yeah. you know, 18 and one, they were scoring 37 points per game. They set an NFL record for 589 points. Yep. There was nothing that should have stopped that team, mm -hmm. uh, but they ran into the hottest team, I think, in playoff history. Like, right. like <laughs> they were a totally different team. We beat them yeah. in, week si in, in week 16. Right. But if you remember in week 16, we had to really struggle to beat them. You know, it was, that's it when was, they were just turning things on. They were just on. turning it around, yeah. You know, and, and that's, you know, and they need a little bit of a little help, some little miracles, luck, little you luck. know, a little, some helmets but and other kind of stuff. That's what happens. But, you know, you look at that team. Tom Brady has a record-breaking year. You have Randy Moss that's on that team. Everything that was in place for that team mm -hmm. yelled championship, yep. yelled no-brainer to pick. Like, yep. if you were a betting person, to put the money on Vegas of them yep. to win it, and you probably wouldn't get paid out more because it probably, you know, the <laughs> odds were so high. But, you know, the fact that they didn't come up with that, I think, still is a sour yeah. spot for the New England fans everywhere. I, I agree. You know, they, they were, you know, what, seven minutes away from winning the game uh, with the David Tyree catch on the helmet and all that kind of thing. You had, as you mentioned, Randy Moss. You had Wes Welker on that team. The defense was, was aging but still very stout. Um, you know, kind of the last year of Brewski and that kind of that group. Um, and uh, they're just an outstanding team all, all over. I mean, you know, and it's hard to, to complain against, you know, a perfect regular season and, and a very good playoff run right up until that point. It all matters if you win the last game. It really does. And, and, and you know, not to take anything away from the Giants. The Giants were nope. the better team that day. They, they came in with a terrific game plan. As we've seen over the past several years, for whatever reason, Tom the Giants, Coughlin the has, Giants the has their number a little bit. You <laughs> yep. know? And so, you know, it's funny. You talk about this year. Is there one team you don't want to meet in the in the playoffs? To me, it's the Giants, yeah. which is bizarre because they're only five and four or something right. like that. Or the, Pan the Panthers may be undefeated. The Panthers may be undefeated. The Giants, but I don't want to see the, the Giants. Giants forever are going to be the team that you don't want to. <laughs> you go know, up I against. don't want to see the Giants. So, so our best. So we agreed on this. Our best Patriots team of all time that did not win the championship was the 2007. Yeah, and I think that one's a no-brainer. And I, I think if you ask anyone who's the best team in NFL history. That didn't not win to a win. Championship. I think people are going to settle on the. I think people Patriots. are going to settle on the Patriots. And Giants fans are not quick to, especially after this past weekend. Yeah. Oh, we beat the Giants, but we still beat you in 07 yeah. and 2011. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and you got to give it to them. I mean, yeah, they just, did. Can't argue with it. They That's beat right. us. I think we agree on the next one also, and that is the best Boston Celtics team not to win a championship. And it's very easy to look at a couple of these teams. I seriously considered the 2011. Uh, Celtics, who had Pierce and Garnett and Ray Allen and Shaquille O'Neal and Jermaine O'Neal, and they were a terrific team. The the the, uh, the core of that team only played five games together the entire season, um, with uh, um, without some of them being injured. Right. And they came to within five minutes in Game Seven of winning the championship that year. But that's not the team I picked. Had they all been in their prime? Had they all been in their prime? <laughs> that would well, have been, a, would different have been a different story. story. Right. Uh, they probably wouldn't have gotten as injured. So I think you picked the same one I did. And you picked what? I picked the 84-85 Celtics. 84-85 Celtics is the same one I I picked. mean, you look in, you look in the term uh, in, in the realm of 1980 Celtics. Obviously, yeah. fantastic teams all through sure. and through. You had the big three. You had Robert Parrish and Larry Bird and, and Kevin McHale. Um, but 84-85, the Celtics were 63-19. and 19. Yep. Pretty fantastic record as you look at that. Yep. Um, Larry Bird averaging 28.7 points, 10.5 rebounds, 6.5 assists per game. Like, he was the MVP that season. Yeah, you know, a fantastic season. And here's the thing that, that I think when you look at the best teams not to win, mm -hmm. they coasted yes, through they the did. first three rounds of yep. the playoffs. Yep. Like, it wasn't even it wasn't even. They a lost challenge. four games yeah. over that series. Yep. And then when they got to the finals against the Lakers and it was Magic and Kareem, they dropped two home games yes, they did. in that series. If you can't win at home. If you can't win at home, you can't win the series. A couple other things about that team. Kevin McHale is a Hall of Famer. He was the sixth man on that team. He didn't even start. Cedric Maxwell was the starter. So that's something that people forget. You had the MVP and the sixth man on that team. Of the players on that team, Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, Rick Carlisle, Danny Ainge, Dennis Johnson, and Sam Vincent all coached in the NBA later on. So, so I mean, it, was just not, it wasn't just a talented team in terms of physicality on the floor. It was in terms of the brains and game strategy and all that kind of thing. It was one of those teams where they said about Casey Jones, he could literally roll the balls out on the floor and just let him play. It was an outstanding, outstanding team all around. You know, and, and I've watched the games that they have, on, that they play on ESPN Classic of right, those teams. Right. 
fundamentally sound basketball. Mm -hmm. um, and that team really had it all together. But when it comes down to it and you meet, I mean, granted, playing against Magic and Kareem right. and, and the 80s Lakers is not like, no, it's not it's, like a game in the park. I mean, right. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's a formidable legit. opponent, but, yeah. you, you know, you look at a team that won 63 games in the regular season uh, and really rolled it, you know, it was almost like a sharp drop-off. You rolled really? the first three rounds yeah. of the playoffs, yeah. only losing four games, and then you dropped four out of seven. It's, it's my opinion, uh, had this team won the championship, they would have been considered the best Celtics team in history until the next year. <laughs> the 85-86 Celtics won the championship and they were superior in every way. Right. Cedric Maxwell was gone, unfortunately. McHale was a starter, but they replaced McHale on the bench with Bill Walton, another yep. Hall of Famer. Yep. Anyway, we won't talk about them, but because I consider them the best Celtics team of all time. But but uh, yeah, I think this team, had the next year's team not existed and this team had won a championship, the 85 Celtics, they would have been considered the best Celtics team of all time. You know, and you look at the run, you look at the run of that in the in the 80s and, you know, obviously the Celtics had, had their string of titles and everything. Sure. In there, but man, you know, you look at what, look at what, could, what could have been. What, what could have been. been? It's the same thing of looking at the looking at the Patriots in their yep. in their run of everything in the yep. past fifteen years. It's, it's the it's, ones that it's the ones you lose. And you can say that about the modern Celtics, also the Pearson Garnett Celtics. Right. You know, people forget that they they lost you know the finals there too. They could have had at least two, possibly three championships had the injuries gone right. not gone their way. Um, you know, the '85 Celtics weren't injured. I think quite honestly, they ran out of gas. Yeah. And that, and and they recognized that, and and they brought in Walton to play the Lakers. Ironically, they didn't play the Lakers right. in the 86 <laughs> finals, but that's why they brought in Walton, because right. they recognized that they were out-physical in that 85 series by the Lakers. And who better to band. bring in than and who better to Walton bring in. himself? Yeah, you know, Walton was a, an amazing guy, and this is not really in our topic, but I always look, they, Walton was, was, was healthy three years of his NBA career. He won a championship every year he was healthy. Um, the rest of the time he was saddled with injuries and didn't win championships, but uh, anyway, that's not really our topic for today. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a whole show on Bill Walton sometime. <laughs> All right, so we have the 2007 Patriots. We have the 1985 Celtics. From here on out, you and I we're are at odds. Yeah, we're going to We are at right. odds. We're going to talk about the Boston Red Sox. To me, the best Red Sox team of all time that did not win the championship was the 1978 Red Sox. Now, okay. I have a little bit of a thing here because the 78 Red Sox are just about my favorite team of all time. Um, a couple facts about the 78 Red Sox. They won 99 games, which is more than any other Red Sox team in history. Um, they had the MVP in Jim Rice. Uh, they had uh, second place in the, uh, in the Cy Young in Dennis Eckersley. Their number nine hitter, Butch Hobson, hit 30 home runs. <laughs> Not bad. Not, Not bad. bad. You know, they, they had a, a precipitous collapse in September, which we were seeing a couple of times. Um, but they still finished the season tied with the Yankees. They, they had to go to a one-game playoff in Fenway Park that they lost, and that's why they didn't move on. They didn't even move on to the playoffs that year uh, because they, they lost that one-game playoff to the Yankees. Uh, so lots of things stacking up there. My opinion is, and the, my humble opinion is, that Don Zimmer, the manager of the Red Sox, had pitched uh, Bill Lee in that one-game playoff instead of Mike Torres, whom he pitched. Always go with the spaceman. Always <laughs> go with the spaceman. My, uh, Bill Lee had a better record against uh, the Yankees, had a better pitching thing, but Zimmer didn't like Bill Lee. And it was mutual. Billy didn't like Zimmer either. And so he let his, I, my opinion is, is he let his personal feelings get in the way. You have a different Red Sox team. I do. And mine goes way before my time. Way back. Uh, but as I was doing some research for this topic, um, the 1946 Red Sox are a team mm -hmm. that overall at the end of the year, this is when they played a shortened schedule, but were yeah. 104 and 50. Uh, Joe Cronin was the manager. You have Ted Williams, who was playing his first year back yep. after, after, his, after his years of service. Yep. And he came back, batted 342, had 38 home runs, 123 RBIs. You had Dom DiMaggio, Johnny Pesky, Bobby Doerr. Yep. This team was stacked. Um, and they played really well the entire, the entire uh, season and mm -hmm. in the playoffs. Uh, when they got to the playoffs, they lost to the Cardinals, who mm -hmm. equally were as good, you know, 96 and 58, um, but dropped it to them in seven games. I looked through the Cardinals' roster for that mm -hmm. year, and all they had, I mean, yes, they had Stan the they Man. Stan the Man, yeah. <laughs> but no other recognizable names. But you look yeah. at everyone who the Red Sox had, uh, with that record and that kind of firepower, sure. That's a team that should go on and win, and you know, and I, you know, I named the names there that are the big ones that that right. stand out. But if there was one year, and I'm I'm probably one of the biggest Ted Williams guys you'll ever meet. Yeah. If there's one year that they were going to win that, um, it was going to be '46. Because you look at after '46, that's you know Ted's back from uh, Ted and a bunch of the other guys are yeah, back. Yeah, a service. lot of those guys served um, in the war. Yeah. 
They came back at different times. Forty-six was the first year the entire team was together again after the war was over. Right, but then and that the was, big piece was Williams, of course. It, and it, but it came kind of down from there at yeah. that point of people on the the you right. know the well people started retiring and all that kind of thing. Just to point something out about the seventy-eight Red Sox, because you mentioned uh, the forty-six Red Sox had two Hall of Famers on it, I believe, Williams and Dore. Seventy-eight Red Sox had three: Rice, uh, Fisk, and Yaz. And that's not counting Dewey Evans, who I believe should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, and and uh, Tom's are power hitters. You had uh, George the Boomer Scott, and of course, playing second base is everyone's favorite, Jerry Remy. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I, 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 I admit or submit though that Bobby Doerr is probably a better second baseman than Jerry Remy uh, uh, in his know. playing days. But, <laughs> but okay, we need to move on. But a couple of great Red Sox teams Absolutely. there. I wish I could have seen the '46 Red Sox play. I, yeah. You know, I, I, if I, if I could have my my sports dream would be to go back and watch some games of the '46 Red Sox in Fenway Park. Uh, that's one of the things I wish I could do. You know, yeah. in the past that and. And, you know, one of the 60s Celtics teams with Russell. I wish yeah. I could go back and see. All right, last group is the Boston Bruins. All right, I picked the 77-78 Boston Bruins. And these are some of the reasons why. 51-18, and 18, which made them first in the NHL. They did lose to Montreal 4-2 uh, to two in the finals, but they had two overtime games in that, in that Kent Stanley Cup series. They only had one loss in the playoffs prior to the finals, to, to the Stanley Cup finals. Um, they had some aging veterans, Johnny Busick, Jerry Cheevers, that kind of thing. They had 11 players with 20 goals or more <laughs> on that team. They were led by Peter McNabb with 41. So, I mean, you know, this was part of, probably the last team of the 70s Big Bad Bruins. This was the end of the Big Bad Bruins, and, and, but they kind of knew that and they just kind of gave everything they had in that season. You picked a different Big Bad so Bruins. So I picked, I, yes, I picked the beginning of the Big Bad the big Bruins. Big, the uh, of the big it was bad a 1971 Bruins. Bruins. Finished 57 and 14, 57, 14 and 7. They scored at that point 399 mm -hmm. goals, which was a record uh, at that point. And the next closest team was 122 goals short of that. Um, wow. They set an NHL record for having 10 different skaters score 20 plus goals that season. Yep. Uh, Bobby Orr had 102 assists himself. Phil Esposito led the team with 76 goals and 152 points. Um, phenomenal team. Yep. Got to the playoffs. Got to the uh, got to the first round. Yep. Lost to the Montreal Canadiens. <laughs> However, they were playing this guy. I don't know if you ever heard of him. The, the goalie for the Canadiens is a guy named Ken Dryden. Ken Dryden. Okay. Who might be one of the greatest the greatest goalies the greatest of all time. Goal goaltender yeah. of all time. Patrick so, Roy. Yeah. You know, but you know. Yeah. They they're said in the same breath yeah, a lot yeah, of times. Yeah. So you know, you look at that team. Uh, just they had so much going for them, and they hit a hot goaltender, and they right. petered out. But at that point, the, the record you said that they set in '78 yep. broke the record of the '71 team. 71 team. I picked the '78 team over the '71 team because they made it farther. That primarily, that's the reason I picked them. They went farther in the playoffs than the than the '71 team did. For, and and for my age as well, I was going to say 2013 because they should have after yeah, beating they Toronto, should've. they, they should have had the momentum. They Great should've. series against Chicago, but yeah. She came up short on that just one. came up short. Well, I think we're just about out of time here on The Big Picture, but this has been a fantastic topic. I feel as yeah. though we've been cut short a little bit on this one. We could have a lot more to say about this one, but you know, while you're at home, what do you think the best teams of all time are that didn't win a championship? Do you agree with us? Do you disagree with us? Well, we don't really care if you disagree with us. We, <laughs> we really think we're right. So anyway, thank you for watching The Big Picture. Thank you to Ryan for being Thanks on our show. Thanks for having me. And uh, we hope we'll see you next time. Uh, take care and uh, have a good day.